Good morning. We've been talking about debt retirement as well. And uh, before year end, we want to raise a portion of money. We got some donations this past week. We'll update the cross next week. I was just talking with them. We hadn't updated it. We actually got some contributions in this past week. And we're looking to try to increase giving by allowing individuals to be able to defer one month or part of a month of a debt. So we received $7,700 this past week. And so that shrink, what we're trying to do is get $16,000, so we're on our way. So that's a great deal. Great deal. My mother visited Niagara Falls once and um, told us that they had Turned the falls off. So she said she got there, and she looked over at the, the Canadian falls, the Horseshoe Falls, they were fine, and looked at the American falls, and they had been turned off. So you just imagine somebody up there going, wee, 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 you know. But you know what? You know what I found out? That uh, she, she arrived there probably in 1969. And what happened in 1969? They diverted the Niagara River. They built a huge dam and diverted the river away from that side of the falls so they had turned the falls off so that they could clean up the rocks. And my mother just happened to be there in 1969 during one of those several months where they had turned it off. It seems kind of weird that you can turn something that powerful off. And what we're going to discover this morning is that the power of God, it's possible to turn it off. Possible to turn off the power of God. We're going to look into see how that works. What we're going to talk about the fact is that you can turn the power on as well. If you turn up the message, you turn on the power. If you turn down the message, you turn off the power. Let's look at the, the positive sign. Turn up the message, you turn on the power. What it says in your worship folder in Second Timothy chapter one verses thirteen through fourteen, Paul writes, "What you've heard from me, keep as the pattern of sound teaching, with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us." It says a couple of things. Uh, guard the message. Guard the message. God has given the church, and the church is us. And so we are the church. The church isn't just the leadership. The church isn't just the people. The church isn't just the building. It, I act really specifically and more particularly, the church is us, the people who have gathered together. Church literally means the called out ones. God has given us something to protect. And when you think of what happens in a church, a couple of things happen, and we'll let them begin with the letter P. And we could protect different things. We could protect the people. What that means is that we would make sure that whatever we do here would be to your liking. We would protect people. So all of us would be happy as we go out. That's one thing we could protect. We could protect the pastors. Well, that's a good idea. Make sure that whatever happens here is to the benefit of those who are on staff. We could protect the place, this facility, the grounds, the building here, the building over where we office out of. And what we could do is we could exist to make sure that this thing stays in pristine condition. We could protect the people. We could protect the pastors. We could protect the place. We could protect the programs. And what we could do is to make sure whatever we do, that the programs that we engage in as a church, those receive the utmost attention, that we always lead with our best foot forward, our programs are great, or we could protect the praise, make sure that our music is always the very best. We could protect all those things. And you know, as a church, we care about all those things, we care about people, we care about pastors, we care about programs, we care about place, and we care about praise. But when the dust clears and when God evaluates how well we've done what we have been entrusted with, he will not ask 
if we protected one another. Won't ask if we protected the people. Won't ask if we protected the pastors, although, again, that's a good idea. Won't ask if we protected the place. Won't ask if we protected the program. Won't ask if we protected the praise. Uh, what it says, what you've heard from me keep is the pattern of sound teaching. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. What the good deposit, the pattern of sound teaching. You know what we're supposed to connect? You know what we're supposed to protect? The message. The message. We're stewards. And what a steward is, it's when the administrator of a house gives somebody something to be able to give to the staff of a house. God is the ultimate owner of the house. Jesus is the primary steward, and the church exists to be his helpers. The Father gives the Son something to give to the world, and the church are those who are are attending, coming alongside Jesus to help to distribute that thing. And the thing that is distributed is a message that the Father gives the Son The Son gives those who gather around the Son, and the church gives it out. We do two things. We guard this message as if it were, because it is something very precious. We guard it, and we give it. And that's ultimately how we're going to be assessed. Did we guard the message? Did we protect it? Did we keep it in pure, pristine order? And did we give it to people who would be able to give it to others as well? Um, the pattern of sound teaching. And that's how we'll be evaluated. It says it's required of a steward to be found faithful. I want you to imagine that we exist as ambassadors. Maybe as ambassadors who will be sent to Syria. Big, big stuff in Syria. A lot of decisions being, being made there. Imagine that we are an, a court of ambassadors sent to Syria by the government to reflect what the government says to Syria now, which is far But Let's say the government decided what to do. And we were charged with the purpose of taking the message and going to Syria with it. How would we be assessed? Did we say what the president told us to say? That's how we'd be assessed. If we changed that message, that's not going to go over real well, is it? If we said everything's fine, everything's not fine. We made it look worse then. Um, and that's the way we will be assessed. And, and so from the beginning, so what we do, and no church is perfect, but we take this very seriously. And so what we try to do is protect the message. And we want to have, we really do want this to be a place where you get your needs met. And we want to protect the place. And we want to have good music. And we want to have good programs. And, and yet we make sure that we protect the message. For instance, children's ministry. We had some of children's ministry. Amanda's on the last week. Uh, Denise is the children's ministry coordinator. Amanda has been functioning over the course of the summer. A number of you volunteered. That's great. Gave our regular teachers off. But you know what? When we think of children's ministry, we have a good children's ministry. In fact, we're repurposing some of the rooms. We were working on it yesterday to be able to allow for greater numbers. Um, and that's part of dealing with the place and helping with the programs and helping with the people. We care about kids. Kids are people. We want to make sure that they're in a place that they can be comfortable, but ultimately, you know what we want? We really do want them to get the message. And so for that reason, we have a hard time. Here's our difficulty. We can't find a curriculum that we can just use as it is. Denise evaluates the curriculum, and if it's not in line with what we want to say, then it has to be changed. Why? Isn't that going to a little bit too much trouble? No. No. We're called to protect the message. And we take that very seriously. She takes it very seriously. Um, So you can do both, but ultimately we guard the message and we give the message. Look what it says, 2 Timothy 2, 1 to 2. You then, my son... Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, and trust reliable men and women who will be able to qualify to teach others. To do what we're supposed to do, we have to not only get the message, but 
get it in such a way as to allow people to give it. They say in church that there's an 80-20 problem. An 80-20 problem. Here's the 80-20 problem. What does the morning services exist for? To help us to grow. To help us to get the message. Appropriate. What do Bible studies exist for? To help us get the message. That's appropriate. The problem with it is that 80% goes to enable us to get the message, and 20% goes to enabling us to give it. That's the 80-20 problem. It's all about us and not about what we get so that we can give it to others. And so it's important that we do both. Would you agree? To get the message and be in a position to give it. We're going to talk about the core four. We're going to talk about four Bible studies that we have been doing that will allow us to be able to get the four core books that we believe really crystallize different facets of the message. Um, We've been doing this, and um, actually, we've been doing this all along. JC, if you remember, uh, when we talked about leaving O'Gorman with the middle school, we said, we're going to come to a place, and I remember JC being up front and indicating we're not going to become a church because we are a church. We are already functioning in the way that we will continue to function. We've been doing Bible studies that allow us to get the message. In fact, we've come to a place where a number of people have been through the studies. And they're at the place that they have the ability and the availability not only to try to figure out how can I understand, but how can I give these messages to others. We're going to talk about some Sunday morning and Wednesday night studies that are open to everyone, but we have a few other studies that involve people that have already been through a number of the studies, and these studies exist for people who've been through some of these things, and they are closed groups. We selected, we said, well, you've been in this, and you've been in a number of studies, and What we do is to grab these people together, and we do some on Saturday mornings, to allow people to go back over the same material. But this time, not only to get it, but to think about giving it. We don't want the 80-20 problem, which is these groups exist not just to get the message, but to talk about the same material in order to get a clearer focus in order to be able to give it. Um, And that's what we're called to do. The purpose is to know well enough to give it. We had a work project recently. Uh, Help JC do some work stuff. Had a friend there who was uh, familiar with. A uh, friend came up and he goes, hey, you remember me? And then so I said, yeah, I remember you. He used to come to Hope. And we talked a little bit, and I said uh, to him, you know, JC says really good things about you. And he has. He said, he, you have the capacity to understand some facets of this message and to be in a place to give it to others. And then we ended up talking about the fact, you know what? I'm really glad that you are where you are. We talked about the fact that our purpose really is not to grow a big church. Our purpose is not to make sure that all the people who come here are happy and we protect the place and we protect the program and we have the best praise. Our purpose is to Guard the message and give it. You know, here's a guy, and JC has a study with him, who's getting the message, and he's giving it in another place. That makes sense, doesn't it? Ultimately, we don't want to possess it. We'd like to take a message, allow us to both get it and give it, because it needs to be known outside the walls. And here's the guy who's doing it. I said to him, if there's anything that we can do for you, but there's no competition there. Now, he's a great guy. It'd be nice if he was here, but we don't want everybody to come here. We don't. Is how could they hear? And that's ultimately our purpose. Um, purpose is to get the message and to give it. It shouldn't be surprising for us to discover that ceasing to guard and to give the message has profound impl- implications. If we turn down the message, we turn down the power. Look what it says. Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. We were going to do a baptism this morning. We'll end up doing it another time. Uh, for a number of different reasons, we decided that we were going to postpone it. Hot as blazes, we probably would cook anybody in there today anyway, so maybe that's, maybe we get some lobsters and baptize them. I could have, that could have gone without being said. You know, you just, every once in a while, you just get up there and it, it's already out, and then you try to grab it, and it's gone. It's gone. There it is. There it goes. Yeah, lobsters. 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 Okay. Um, 
Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with words of human wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. The cross of Christ be emptied of its power. My mother went to Niagara Falls, and the river had been diverted. Somehow, it seems like something that shouldn't be allowed to happen, happened, and it's possible for the falls to be shut off and for the cross of Christ to be emptied of its power. How in the world does that happen? How in the world does that happen? The turning down the message results in turning off the power. If we don't protect the message, we don't preserve the power. If we protect the message, we protect the power. They go together. To distort the message is to decrease the power. To preserve the message is to sustain the power. They go, you say, well, wait, 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 wait. But it's possible to, you don't need to be that particular and picky about the message, do we? I mean, really. It's hard to evaluate how successful. Here's what happens with this. Paul talks about human wisdom, and here's what happened in Corinth. Apollos was really smart. He was from Alexandria, and he was one of the people. Now, he spun the message a little bit in order to appeal to Jews. Maybe that's what, I think that's probably what happened. He was involved in the church in Corinth, to which Paul went there, and Paul preached the message, and then Apollos came, and and he put a little spin on it and involved more people in Apollos' group. And Peter even went there, and he might have spun it a little bit different. So now there are more people, more people going to church in three different communities. That's successful, right? Right? That's successful, right? More people going to church? Right? Right? What? No? No. What he said is appealing to people. So it, hmm, I like that better. I like that better. When it's not preserving the truth, it's protecting the people. And what he ended up doing, walls end up going off. And so now where there was a community, now they were a boink, boink, boink. And you know what Paul says? That's not success. That's failure. We emptied the cross of power. The cross, you know what the cross is supposed to do? It's not supposed to build walls. It's supposed to demolish them. That's what the cross is supposed to do. And it wasn't doing it, even though more people were coming. Hmm, Interesting. Possible to turn off the power of the cross. And you can't always determine right now whether something's successful or not. Is this a successful church? Got nothing. <laughs> Got nothing. Hmm. You know who the one to determine? Who's going to determine whether it's successful or not? And what will he use as a criteria? How have we protected the message? We'll have to see, but you don't understand what I mean. You can not protect the message and have a bunch of people. You cannot protect the message and have a bunch of programs. You cannot protect the message and have a great place. Do you understand? It's tricky to try to figure out if something's successful or not because you can't tell right now. There's somebody, we might get up here and preach fire and brimstone and get you to behave. Now, if we get you to behave in a more moral way, that's success, isn't it? You're doing this. If we get you to do that, that's successful, right? 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 It all depends why you do it. It all depends why. If I frighten you into behaving, does the gospel rely on fear to promote obedience? And if we then use fear to promote obedience, have we succeeded? We have failed. We have failed. Oh, but people are being more moral. God's not going to look at morality. That'll be part of it. He'll look at belief. 
Are we believing the things about him that are true? All depends. Are we saying those things? Yeah. Tricky, isn't it? Tricky. Not as clean, not as clear. You can't always determine if a church is successful or not by right now. You know how we'll tell? Ten years from now, if your thinking is changing, if you're thinking of the message, if you're getting it, and if you are, now you don't have to be evangelist, but discern. That's point one. It's, you'll hear something, and you'll say, eh, off by a covenant. You'll hear things, eh, and you might not say it out loud. I think that's the beginning. You discern what's true and what isn't. Look what it says. Paul says, in 2 Corinthians 11, 2 through 4, I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preached, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. When the gospel is distorted, you end up with a counterfeit Jesus, a Jesus other than the Jesus that was preached. You know what's interesting about a counterfeit gospel? It empties the cross of power and puts a counterfeit Jesus up there. So you can fail to protect the message and talk about Jesus, but it's not the Jesus of the new covenant. You understand what I mean? It gets confusing. It's confusing. When we fail to protect the gospel, the power of God gets turned off. When we turn down the message, we turn off the power. When we turn up the message, we turn on the power. Turn on the power. Look what Paul says. I am not ashamed of the gospel, Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just it is is, is just as it is written. The righteous will live by faith. The power of God is channeled. Look at the verse. What does it say? In what is the power of God? I am not ashamed of the gospel. The gospel is the good news. In the good news is the power of God. So God channels his power through a message. If we protect the message, we preserve the if we distort the message, we decrease the. They go together. They go together. That's why you protect the message, you preserve the power. Um, you'd imagine that the greatest threat to Christianity would be secular humanism, right? Secular humanism. People who are secular really don't think about God. That's the greatest threat. You know what's interesting? Look what it says. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick it up. Hey, I'm, let me ask you a question first. Look up here. If the power, the power of God is what? Here's a question. Don't look. Where's the power of sin? Ooh. Where's the power of sin? What is that? Yes, I'm here. Q. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the? Law. Isn't that interesting? Do you know what is a greater threat than secular humanism? Listen to me. Listen. Sacred legalism. Sacred legalism is a far more dangerous threat than secular humanism. The power of sin is the law. Religious communities that misrepresent the message are dangerous. Failing to protect the message turns down the power. The power of God is channeled in the gospel. Um, what happened to the prodigal son? Remember the prodigal son? What happened to the prodigal son? Yeah, he went into town and he did bad things. And again, those were bad things he did. He squandered the inheritance in ways that were unhealthy, extramarital, intercourse, whatever he did. He just did a bunch of things that are inappropriate and wrong. 
Is that what happened to him? You know what happened to the prodigal son? The older brother. That's what happened to the prodigal son. And the older brother, you know what the older brother was doing? Slaving in the fields. Trying to please an impossible to please God. He never would think of having a discussion with his father because his father wanted him to make sure he did. And so the younger son looked at the older brother and said, if that's life with dad, I'm out. I'm out. Until he got to a place where he was eating pig slop. And this guy was just about to eat pig slop, the prodigal son, and he's down and he's looking at that and he's saying, I'd really like to eat that. That's not a good thing. (laughs) He's looking down at that pig stuff and then he thinks, wait a minute. And you know what it says in the Bible? He comes to his senses and for the first time he looked at his father, but not through the eyes of the older brother. He looked at his father. He thought about him. He said, wait a minute. My father feeds his workers. Has that ever happened to you? People told you all these things about God, but then you really started to think about him on your own, and you started to say, you know what? What I heard about you wasn't true. You know what that's called? Coming to your senses. And when you come to your senses, you know what ends up happening? Well, what happened to the prodigal son? Where did he go? He went home. He went home to his father. Did he have to drag himself home to his father? No. Did he, did he, was he dragged home to his father because somebody said, you, you better get back to your father or we're going to pull the, the weight of law down on you. Is that what happened? No. He wanted to go. Why? Because he was looking at him. And that's, that's what... That's what happened to the the prodigal son. How do you heal somebody who's a prodigal? Remember the woman caught in adultery? Remember that one? This woman commits adultery. She did the act. They bring the woman, the sacred legalists, brought this woman and said, in the law, Moses commands us to stone a woman like this. Jesus, what are you going to do? They have him, and they think they have Jesus because if he stones the women, he offends the lawbreakers. If he doesn't stone the woman, he offends the lawmakers. They say, we've got him. He's going to do one or the other. And then, well, we don't know what Jesus wrote. He, he wrote down, wrote something on the ground, and the sacred legalists walked away one at a time, writing stuff on the ground. Until he is there with this woman. Now, does this woman have a behavior problem? Does she have a behavior problem? Yeah. Yeah. And so what Jesus said is this. Where are your accusers? No one here to accuse you? No one, sir. And I think she was looking at him then. No one. Because Jesus cleared them out. You know why? So she could see him but not reflected in the eyes of all the sacred legalists gathered around. He said, okay, we need you out of here. No, you're not a sacred legalist, but let's just just say that you were. And the woman's here, so we might need to get you out of the way and and you out of the sacred legalist. (laughs) Until what's happening is just Jesus and the woman, because Jesus cleared everyone else out, and there's no other place for her to look. Has that ever happened to you? You felt isolated? that you can't, you couldn't look at God the way your family did, the way your church did. It feels lonely, doesn't it? You feel isolated. But then you end up getting, and you know what this woman sees? Jesus saying, imagine you're this woman. Imagine you're this woman. And Jesus ends up saying, I don't condemn you. And she's waiting for the but. I don't condemn you. He does say something. But the first thing he says is that. She knows she's speaking to someone who represents God. And God just said to her, I do not condemn you. And you know what he says then? Go now. Leave your life of sin. I've said this before. And we know what she did. She went 
right back to bed with that guy, right? I would agree. Somebody shaking his head, no. I don't think she went back to bed with that guy. You know why? Because she was thinking, this is what I was looking for. This is what I was looking for. Someone who would see me and say, I don't condemn you, so now I really don't have to jump in the sack with Jack in order to feel okay about myself. I don't need to hop in the bed with Fred. <laughs> okay, I'll stop there. I'll stop there. I'll stop there in order to believe I'm loved. Because I see it here. Again, she, she, wasn't a, she didn't become a perfect woman. It, it impacted her, don't you think? You know why? She saw God. And he said, I don't condemn you. Go now, leave your life of sin. If she heard the first, she could do the second. Now, are we going to be perfect? Absolutely not. I'll tell you what, it depends on the... If we see God through the eyes of sacred legalists, to the degree, the power of God is turned down. To the degree we see God clearly through the gospel, the power of God is turned up because the power of God and the purity of the gospel go hand in hand. Um, to understand the gospel, we must understand the difference between what the sacred legalists say and what Jesus said. The greatest threat is second. And again, I'm not speaking of a particular church. But the Bible, there's four books. I'm going to call them the core four that end up in a very careful way helping us to identify what is the gospel and what isn't the gospel. Hebrews, Romans, Galatians, and 2 Corinthians. Hebrews. Hebrews. That's, that's it. There, there isn't. I didn't spell them out. The core four. Go back, Abby. I, 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 the core four. Hebrews. And that's what we call the, it's the foundation. If you want to be able to look at the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, through Christian eyes, the book of Hebrews is the place you want to go. It gives us a way to understand how much of the Old Testament applies and how much isn't. Is, do, we, do we just do away with the Old Testament? No. No, we don't. But how are we to look at it? Hebrews will help you with that. It's the base for grace. The base. It teaches some foundational things about the law and high priest. And, and so that's why we, one of the core four is Hebrews. It helps us to understand our roots. Christianity was cut from the cloth of Judaism. To understand Christianity helps us if we understand Judaism. That's Hebrews. Hebrews is the first of the core four. And you know why I'm talking about these books? Because if I had an objective for you in your Christian life between now and the time that you go back to see him and look at him face to face, it would be that you develop a greater familiarity with Hebrews, Romans, Galatians, and 2 Corinthians. And why would I do that? Because if you do so, you will have a clearer idea of what the message is. And if you understand what the message is, what are you preserving? The power. Because the purity of the message and the power of God go hand in hand. And that's why. So here's a place. We'll help you do that, but read them on your own. Ask questions. The core four, do you know what they are? Can you say them? What's the first? What's the second? What's the third? What's the fourth? The core four. And again, there's other, but I'm not saying that those are higher, but they are specific. Well, Hebrews gives you the foundation. Romans, when Paul was going to go make a trip. He was going to go to Spain, we think, and he wanted to go by Rome. He hadn't been to Rome yet. So what he did, he writes a letter in which he writes out what the message is very carefully. Here's the gospel. Chapters 1 through 8, he gives the theology of it. Chapters 9 through 11, he talks about Jew versus Gentile. 12 through 16, he talks about how we live then. And he writes this letter and he sends it to the church at Rome. Because he says, here, well, this will help you get to know my message, so when I come, you'll already have read about it. And that's why the Romans is the case for grace. It spells out what the good news is. It's been the book that changed the life of John Wesley. It changed the life of a number of historical religious figures who ended up looking at Christianity, and then they looked at Romans and understood it. Martin Luther, the same thing. It was Luther's book. They saw the message in, in Romans, and what it did, it turned their Christian life 
upside down. They couldn't look at God the same way. They came to their senses. Romans, the case for grace, it spells out the message. Okay, the first of the core for Hebrews, that's the base for grace. Romans is the case for grace. It spells it out. But then what happens? When you're at church and you understand the message, but then other people come on the radio or on TV, or they're your neighbors, and they pull you away. Can that happen? That's Galatians. That's what happens in Galatians. Paul comes into this place, helps them to get a foundation. He leaves. Somebody else comes in and says, okay, Paul was good on a couple things, but bad on a few, and they confuse everything. And so what ends up happening, this group of people who were really loving, what do you think happened? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, let's play a little bit. Jesus loves you. For, let, let's play. I'm, I'm, let, let me be Paul. Okay? The gospel is this. The gospel is that through faith in Christ, you become children of God. What else do we have to do? Believe. That sounds pretty good. And you know what ended up happening to this church? Well, they believed it. He was there long enough to help them believe it. They breathed a sigh of relief. Oh, man, I can get my finger off my spiritual pulse. You know what they started to do? Get this. They started to, you're not going to believe it. You're not going to believe it. They started to love each other. (laughs) And not only that, they started to love God too. All kinds of stuff were happening. Then this guy comes and he has his top button button. Well, Paul was right in a few things, but he was wrong in many others. It's important that you obey the rules so that you're really loved by God. God loves you if you believe in Jesus, but he'll love you even more if you observe the holy days. And you know what they ended up doing? They ended up buttoning their top buttons. Okay. Now, here's a question. What do you imagine happened to their love for one another? You know what they started doing? Rather than love one another, they started to compare themselves with one another. Well, I might not be much, but... I feel a little bit better when I'm looking at this guy over here. <laughs> and then the same thing. So, you know, and it became like a like a, a Christian body, but you know, so he's pretty well developed, but you know, you know, and then he, you know, and they started to compare themselves with one another. It's hard for you to love a person you're comparing yourself to. Because they looked at him and I consumed his lack of and I may feel better. That's what you know what they ended up doing? Biting and devouring each other. Why does a person bite and devour another person? Because they are hungry. You know what they were hungry for? I want to be loved. And they knew they were loved when the gospel was believed. But then when this other gospel came, they didn't believe they were loved anymore. So now they have to take a bite out of each other and themselves, biting and devouring each other. And that's what Paul writes. What do you imagine he would say to a church? that is consuming each other. Why don't you imagine this church? You've been talking about her, and you've been talking about her, you've been talking about him, and and this place is, you've been, you know what Paul ends up saying to this church? He writes him a letter, the letter of the Galatians. Get with it. No, you know what he ends up saying? The first imperative, understand that through faith in Christ, your children of Abraham. You know what he tells them? Remember the gospel. Do you remember the good news? That through faith in Christ, you're a child of God. Remember the gospel. Understand grace. And you know the second thing he says in chapter 5? Resist legalism. When they come, don't listen. Challenge. Say, eh, off by a covenant. Turn the radio down. If that speaker comes off who makes you afraid, turn it off. Say no to legalism. And then finally in chapter 5, you know what he says? Use your freedom to serve one another in love. Understand grace. Resist legalism. Serve one another in love. And he doesn't tell them to start to be loving until chapter 5. Why? Because the behavior is not the problem. It's the belief. They lost sight of the message. Duh. If you lose sight of the message, where does the power go? Goes, gone. Can't love each other. It takes power to love one another. Comes with the gospel. That's Galatians. It's the race for grace. They were running, 
making progress, they were cut in on. Finally, there's, what do you do if you're a person, because ultimately, you remember the two things that we exist as a church to do, to get the message and to give it. What happens if you become a person who wants to give the message away? A number of individuals like that. Here, growing number. What happens to that? That's 2 Corinthians. You know what ends up happening? When you decide that you want to be involved in God's ministry, here's what he does. I'm just crossing my fingers. That means I'm about to tell a lie, and I want to telegraph I'm telling a lie. <laughs> he will put you in a place where you will not get touched by difficulties. He will, it's like if there's a beautiful, let's say, this, this is a, this looks like, a Coke bottle, but this is really a very priceless metal, uridium. This is uridium. So God puts you in a uridium-encased vessel, and he puts you in this place where nothing's ever going to touch this vessel. This is what happens when you are God's servant. He puts you in a place out of harm's way, right? Right? You know what ends up happening when, you're in, when you end up being he... Let's make this what it is. You know what this is? Plastic. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> and here's what just happened. God just took hold of my hand, directed this vessel to hit the person who is a wonderful person, Tammy. They, Something tells me that's going to be something that people will remind me of. It's like <laughs> life groups meet in the bedrooms. It's one of it's one of it's one of they don't meet in the bedrooms, do they, Josh? I think they don't. <laughs> Can't believe it. Oh, brother. I gotta get I gotta get off of here before I hurt somebody else. Uh. That's a core four. <laughs> Somebody made a, um, and I'm going to close with this, and we'll have the final song. Somebody paid this church an upside-down compliment. They used to come and then left. And that's fine. A lot of people do that, and yeah, that happens. They said we're too technical. Too technical. Very interesting. We're too careful with the message, we should just say God loves you and just let it out there. They said we're too technical, too analytical was the word. You know why we're analytical? And again, not every church is supposed to be the same. You know, it's okay, but because we're supposed to protect the message. And those who are up here and in the Bible studies that we do, we are going to analyze it. In fact, you know why we do the core four? We're going to have the studies and and they are in here, and we're going to do, so every Sunday morning and every Wednesday night, one of the core four will be, will be gone over. We'll meet over in, the, over in the place over there. And some of you are in a place where you've been sitting around, and you like coming to church. And, and you know what I'm going to encourage you? I'm going to encourage you to get the message in a deeper way and to learn to give it to somebody else. That's what I'm going to do. How do you do that? There's a number of places you could go. Some of the Bible studies we're going to do, you come. You know what you'll do? You'll analyze it. We'll look at it together. We'll talk about this word and that word. You'll be able to ask questions. You can't ask questions here. You can ask questions there. And you know what happened? Now, you, you might, you're not going to be able to come to all of them. Maybe you come to some. You could even pop in from time to time. You'll still get something out of them because we go from the basis of, well, here's another thing you could do. Buy my book. <laughs> I won't throw these. No, I <laughs> And they're from the core four. And again, if there's a suggested donation, if you could do it, do it. They're online. They're in the blog on our website. So you can get all these things. They're on the blog. But if you want a written version, you can get this. The base for grace, that's Second Corinthians. And then there's the race for grace, that's Galatians. And then there's the base for grace, that's Hebrews. And the case for grace, that's Romans. And the reason why we put these in print is so that we would 
guard the message and be able to give it to somebody else. A couple of things, 40 days with the 10 commitments, that's the first. This is, and then transforming beliefs. These define the message in a more holistic way, and these are studies right from Scripture. If you have money, get the books. If you don't have money, get the books. Study them and take advantage of some of these studies. Come over. It's not that threatening. Not that threatening. Sometimes you get hit with bottles. Uh, we're going to do a closing song again before I harm anybody else. Um, come on up and um, I'm done. <laughs> Let me pray for us. Uh, thank you for not only designing the message, but putting it in a form that we can re-experience it. We can talk about what the original writers, what their world would have been like. We can think about the words. We can study the words. We can look at it. We can talk about it. We can discuss it. So our sense of the message becomes clearer. We differentiate between the good news of the gospel of grace and the not-so-good news of the law. And as we do so, we see it more clearly. As we understand the message more clearly, we get it. Your power is experienced. It doesn't mean miracles. It means we have the ability to endure, to be able to have faith, to be able to be loving. It changes us. Thanks for your word. Thanks for the opportunity we have to look at it, think about it. Continue to help us to understand its message so that we can be the people you want us to be. In Jesus' name, amen.